I want to speak to you today about when the Mashiach was hanging on the tree. He did not take the myrrh mixed with wine and uh, he did not want to be stupefied and he did not want to be drugged up. He knew he was there to take the Onesh and drink that cup to the dregs. But in America, we have a different set of values. Uh, this country is uh, very much drugged up. And what the drink that he refused hanging there is very much not refused in the United States where tobacco, marijuana, prescription drugs, cocaine, uh, hallucinogenic drugs, heroin, all kinds of uh, benzos, which are uh, depressants, all kinds of stimulants. Now, we know that Adderall is taken by ADHD and uh, narcolepsy patients. A, a case could be made for uh, the proper uh, use of these, um, uh, of, all, of all of these uh, drugs. However, when it comes to hallucinogenic drugs, when it comes to methamphetamine and all of these kinds of drugs, marijuana, the thing that's going on in the wine bars. Why did Moshiach ben Dovid refuse to drink wine during his time of hanging on the tree? In the Gospel of Mark, we see that Yeshua was offered wine. Uh, when it was offered mixed with gall, uh, there's a, a kind of drug that comes from myrrh that was mixed. And uh, the wine was sour and mixed with this drug and he refused it now later when he was so parched he could not speak and he had to speak he had to cry out it is finished in a loud voice well he did moisten his lips the second time a drink was offered to him but he experienced the total drinking of the dregs of our punishment, the Onesh. He wanted to experience it and he wanted it to be complete because it says in Isaiah, chapter 53, that Hashem is watching. And when he sees the travail of his soul, he will be satisfied. And that travail, he did not want numbed with stupefying drugs. And the stupefying drugs that people are using to basically take their youth and destroy it, to put them on a course toward drug addiction, which 
can lead to depression, which can lead to suicidal thoughts, which can lead to more drugs, which can lead to suicide. So someone starts out in their youth with a gateway drug like marijuana and then all their life they are using other drugs. They get depressed so they go to a psychiatrist and he gives them even more drugs because he's a legal drug dealer. Then they get hooked on prescription drugs, Xanax, etc. Then they're not able to really do what they wanted to do with their life because of the stupefaction from drugs. And then when they get really depressed, and since they are on drugs, it doesn't take much to go ahead and end it all with an extra dose. And many drug addicts do kill themselves. And I'm not talking about just a heroin addict who overdoses. I'm talking about people on prescription drugs, on alcohol, who drink themselves to death, people who uh, cause an early death from lung cancer, from cigarette smoking, people who basically throw their life away. And this is what's going on in the United States of stupefaction that we live in. Right up the street here, this area of New York, the west side, it used to be different. But now, marijuana has been legalized. And we have all these smoke shops and marijuana shops. And then we see these young people getting high, taking a big drag off of a marijuana cigarette. Today I saw somebody who looked like they might be 12 years old smoking marijuana as they passed me on the street with a very strong odor of marijuana. This person's life will not end well if they don't come to the Lord. And when you get into the 15th chapter of, of Mark, and you see Mashiach as he's uh, being led like a lamb to the slaughter. And you see all of the mockery, uh, everything that happens. It starts at 9 o'clock in the morning. It goes on uh, until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The, the people are watching, mocking, blaspheming, and they don't understand what is going on, what, what is actually happening. The salvation of the whole world is at stake here. And uh, they say, you know, if you're the Zundfunderoi Bishter, come down. And oh, we know it's kind of rough up there, so we're going to give you a drug to make your pain easier. They don't seem to understand he's undergoing their pain. And uh, it says, and they, they mocked him, and uh, they stripped him uh, of the purple that they had put on him, the crown of thorns. They had been uh, calling him the king of the Jews and bowing down. And now they're putting his own clothes back on him. And... Uh, they don't realize that 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 14 is being fulfilled. Ben David is being hanged on a tree. And there was a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, coming from the field. And uh, he was the father of 
Rufus. When I was in Florida, there was a friend of mine named Rufus. And there were many difficult Saturday nights when Rufus was my companion. And here it says, Rufus and Alexander are obviously famous believers. And why are they famous? Not because of which congregation they're members of, but because of their famous father. Because their famous father was none other than Simon of Cyrene, uh, who carried, who helped carry the boim of the Mashiach ben Dovid, who was so exhausted, so hurting, he had lost so much blood, he was so weak from the beating. He had a whole cohort, some, something like 200 soldiers. And, and he was it, was, it was them against him. And they almost beat him to death. So he couldn't carry his boim. But someone else was forced or impelled to carry it. And each one of us has a boim to carry, my friend. And sometimes it seems very heavy. And sometimes it feels like we can't really pick it up, we can't lift it, we can't drag it anymore. It's too much. Right now in New York we have an infestation of insects. We have an infestation of COVID-19. We have an infestation of drugs and violent crime. We have an infestation of criminals that are arrested and immediately they don't even pay bail. They get right out on the street. And with all these plagues coming upon us and trying to do the ministry, and then the inflation plague where if you go into a store and you want to buy just uh, something simple, it costs three or four times what it used to cost. And the gasoline pump and everything. And we feel like this, this poem is too heavy. But we have to remember that Moshiach ben Dovid is really carrying the boim. And the boim that we carry is really the lighter end because he commands us to take our part in the Great Commission to help him preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And they bring him to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And uh, I don't know whether you can see this or not, but um, in Yiddish, Sharban is the word for skull. And the irony is that for this, for this criminal, quote unquote, there will be no skull because he is the Bar Enosh and he is going to stand up alive. On the third day, his body will not see Shachat. And when the women come to anoint his body, there's no body to anoint. His body's already been anointed by a woman who came with an alabaster jar of perfume. And she broke this expensive jar of perfume. And then she poured the expensive balm on him. And that was his anointing. And they wanted to rebuke her, but she said, well, she didn't actually say anything. He spoke up for her and he said, leave her alone. She's doing a good thing. The poor you will always have with you, but you won't always have me with you. She's anointing my body for burial. And you see, when Mary of Magdala and the other uh, women, when they came to anoint the body, there was no body to anoint but it had already been anointed. 
and all this stuff was happening to fulfill scripture. It was all happening under the orchestration baton of God himself. And the irony is there was no skull for the Barinosh at Golgotha. The place of the skull would not have his skull. His Sharban, the Yiddish word, Sheen Aleph Reish Base Final Noon, for skull. And they, they gave him wine mixed with, with uh, myrrh. Uh, do you see that? Which he has, however, not taken. He did not take drugs. You say, but Dr. Goebel, you don't know the anguish I'm going through and the pain. I have to have my stupefying drugs. Well, which is your pain worse than his? He said, no, I'm not taking it. And they have hanged him up. Second Samuel 18, 14. On the boim. And what did they do? They divided. We're talking about the soldiers. They distributed among themselves his clothing casting lots on them, uh, on his clothing, on his clothing, on his clothing. He, they cast lots on them. In other words, all right, I want this ketan. So if the lot goes this way, that will be mine. If it goes that way, it will be yours. So they gambled. They gambled for his clothing. And this was a fulfillment of scripture. And uh, this uh, also is in the Psalms. I think it's Psalm 69. I can't remember. You need a good study Bible where all these prophecies are annotated in the reference references. And it was the third hour. It was 9 a.m. They had just started the torture. And they hanged him up on the boim. And uh, this is Psalm 22, verses 14 and 15 in Psalm 22, verse 18. And the inscription of his, ac ac of his accusation, his indictment that was inscribed is this. Der King fund de Yidden. That's why he was killed because he was the king of the Yidden. Now if you have a claimant that you are advocating is the Messiah, the king of the Yidden, and if he has not fulfilled these scriptures like Psalm 22 etc, then you are a false prophet and your, your claimant is a false Moshiach. And together with him were hanged up there on the tree. There were two thieves, two. Each Ghanif was hanged, one on one side, one on the other. One, in, one, on, one on his right and one on his left. And this was to fulfill the scripture that says that... Um, and with the uh, Poshaim, the transgressors, the, rebellion, the, the rebels, the lawless, uh, is he reckoned, he became counted with them. Isaiah 53, verse 12. 
And he did this because he's identifying with us. We are the transgressors. We are the rebels. We are the lawless people. And he died for us. And the passerbys, they blasphemed. They shook their heads. They say, ha, ha, you, you who destroys the Heho and builds it up in three days. Then they say, save yourself and come down from the bottom. What they don't understand is if he did that, we would all be in hell because he is wounded for our transgressions. And the Kohanim, the chief priests, they mocked. Also the scribes, the uh, Sopharim, they, they were mocking. And others. He helped others, but he himself he cannot help. And... Uh, the Mashiach, the, the King of Israel, shall he now come down from the tree so that we shall see and believe? Also the ones who were with him were mocking, but one of those had a change of heart. Those that were pierced with him, one of them stopped the mockery because this one was studying him and began to be convicted if you study him you will begin to be convicted and you will see that you can't earn your salvation you're just like this Ghanif and once that conviction comes if you're like the Ghanif you will cry out to him and if you're really like the God, if he will say to you, today you will be with me in Gan Eden. So it's the sixth hour. That's uh, noon, 12 noon. And there was a terrible darkness, like a solar eclipse that came over the land. And this darkness was over the land till about three o'clock in the afternoon. And in the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., Yeshua shouted out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which is a direct quote from chapter 22, verse 1 in the Psalter. And this is meant to get you to read the whole Psalter, which like Isaiah 53 is a very important prophecy of what happened that day on Nisan 14. And it says, and some of the ones who were standing nearby heard it. And they said, look, he's calling for Eliyahu. And one of them ran and, and filled a sponge with vinegar and put it up on a stick to give him something to drink. This is uh, Psalm 69. And uh, someone else says, leave it. We will see if, if quote unquote, Eliyahu will come to, uh, in order to take him down from the tree. Then, uh, then he cried out in a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Notice, volitionally, he gave up the ghost. 
That's something you cannot do. Why can you not do it? Because you're not the bar and osh. I can't say to my spirit right now, okay, die. Now, I could kill myself. Yeah, I could put a gun to my head and blow my brains out. Yeah, that's possible. But I can't volitionally give up the ghost, which is what he does here. This is why Pilate is so amazed. What? You, you want, you're coming to get the body? You mean he's already dead? He sends an officer to, to, make, to confirm. How could he be dead already? Well, he couldn't be dead already if he was an ordinary man. Because an ordinary man can't volitionally give up the ghost. But he could. And the parochet of the Hegel was torn apart in two from top to bottom. And uh, as the Roman officer who was standing opposite him has seen this, uh, well, as you know, as he gave up the ghost, he said, "Surely this man was Hashem's son, because look what he has just done. No ordinary man can do that, and we know the Baranosh was not an ordinary man." And there were women that were looking from a distance. Miriam of Magdala, Miriam the mother of Yaakov, the less, and uh, Yossi, and uh, Shulamit. And uh, they had followed him from the Galil, and they ministered to him, and helped him, and uh, they went up to Jerusalem with him from the Galil, and they were watching. And since evening was coming on, and uh, it was Erev Shabbat, uh, and Shabbos was coming, and uh, Yosef of Arimathea, who was a prominent Counselor, member of the Sanhedrin, uh, and he, he he was a, a righteous man looking for the kingdom, Hashem's kingdom, hoping for the kingdom to arrive. He uh, was able to uh, get his courage up and go and ask for the body and uh, he wrapped the body in the Takrahim <clears throat> took the body down and he, he had his own tomb and uh, that's where the body was put and uh, if you look at the last verse of chapter 15, it says, Miriam of Magdala and Miriam Yossi's mother did see where uh, Joseph of Arimathea placed the body. And this is important because they were members of the Hevra Kadisha. And one of their responsibilities was to make sure that from the moment the person died until the person was put in the grave, and even after that, that they monitored where the body was so that the body could not get lost or misplaced or become something where nobody knows where it is. Oh no, they're right there. That's one of the duties of the Hever Kadisha. And Mark being a Orthodox Jew makes sure to include that. So if you think, oh yeah, the body was lost, that's why they thought the tomb was empty. You either, either you don't want to believe it 
and you're an Orthodox Jew who knows about the Hever Kedisha, the Hever Kedisha, or you don't know about the Hever Kedisha. But that, that last verse in Mark chapter 15 is very important because they are right there monitoring where the body is laid. And notice the baby was protected by a Joseph, Joseph bin Dovid, and the body was protected by another Joseph. So from Joseph to Joseph, God made sure that the miracle of the Bar Enosh standing up alive from the dead, his, his supernatural entrance into the world, and his exit supernaturally. This was protected by two men named Yosef. And when we get to chapter 16, it's uh, Shabbos uh, and actually Shabbos is over. Miriam of Magdala and uh, Miriam the mother of Yaakov and uh, Shulamit they are able to purchase things because Shabbos is over so what do they purchase? They pur purchase some spices now remember I told you the body has already been anointed remember the alabaster jar in Simon the leper's house and the girl that was being rebuked for wasting the expensive perfume and how she was defended by the Moshiach who said leave her alone she's anointing my body for burial and that was the only anointing that there was going to be because these women who purchased the spices uh, in order to go and anoint the body have a problem. It's very early. It's the first day of the week. And they're coming to the tomb. And the sun is going up. And uh, they're saying to one another, Who will remove by rolling for us, us weak women, the heavy stone, the stone-like, well, it was a disc-like stone that rolled backward and for, uh, backward and forward in a little rut to either open or close the entrance of the tomb. And they're wondering how they're going to get it open. They're thinking about the entrance to the tomb. And that's what their concern is. But you know what? We as believers have many worries and many concerns. But we ought to have more faith because God can take care of this stuff. Look, right now I have so many concerns and so many worries about this Yiddish New Testament. But I know that just like with these... <clears throat> God is way ahead of me, and he will, hallelujah, he will take care of problems, so I don't need to worry about them. And so, that's verse 3. Now let's go to verse 4. And as they made a glance, what happened? They saw... And they were shocked that this disc-like heavy stone had been rolled away. It had been rolled away from the entrance of the tomb. So the tomb was empty. How did that happen? What muscular man had, had beat them to the tomb and opened it up for them? 
And uh, this was a very great, very large stone. So they were quite shocked that it was already open. They really didn't have time to think about the who, what, when, where, how of, of the rock, of the stone, the entrance stone of the tomb. Because when they entered the tomb with their spices to anoint the body, you know, a body starts to have an odor when putrefaction begins. And that's why these perfumes are used. And so they go into the tomb with the spices. And what do they see? A boker, a young man. And what is he doing? He's sitting on the right side. The slab where the body would have been, the right side was where this young man was sitting and he was dressed in white. He had white clothing and as soon as they looked at him they could see the, the fact that he was not an ordinary man, the numinous glow of an angel or something terrified them and they were very frightened and he says to them fear not you seek Yeshua of Nazareth the one who is hanged up pierced on the bone. He is risen. He's, he has stood up. He has gotten up. This is why for a believer death is called sleep. When you sleep you get up. And he got up from sleep. He is not here. In other words, you can look all over this tomb, you're not going to find him. And then, and then the angel tells them, here is the place where they laid him. Apparently, Joseph of Arimathea had someone help him pick the body up, wrap it in Takrahim and carry it there from Golgotha and lay it there on the tomb, uh, the slab inside the tomb. And the angel is pointing out, this is where they laid him, but he's not here. Psalm 16, verse 10. He did not see Shahat. Notice, this, this story is very, very simple. There is no added uh, hysteria, all kinds of little uh, legendary things. No, it's a very intact story. And it is history. Mark is not making up something here. This is also the preaching of Kepha. What, what, what was preached all over the world. And this is a great miracle. The greatest miracle of the entire world. The whole history of the world. No miracle is bigger than this miracle. And it's told very simply and factually. Not only is the tomb empty, but there's an angelic explanation. Lest somebody come up with some other explanation for the empty tomb. 
Now, you might not believe in angels. So when you read in Luke about the angel Gabriel coming to Miriam Bat Dovid, you might not believe that. When you hear about those angelic visitations to, to uh, Samson's parents and Daniel and all the people in the Tanakh, you might not believe in that either. You might have an anti-supernatural worldview. But you need to get rid of it because it is dragging you into perdition. Now the angel is giving them a directive. He's saying, now go, tell his disciples, and keep a Petros, the one that was so afraid, who three times denied him, who, who left weeping, feeling that he had left, he had let the Lord down and now there was no possible hope for his ministry. There are many ministers that have done something terrible and uh, they weep and they go off and they think their ministry is over. But this should be an encouragement because even though he did the worst thing you can do, he denied the Lord. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. So he, you might say, well, yeah, Paul was the chief of sinners, but this is pretty bad sin too, right? Maybe he's the chief of sinners. Well, he probably felt that way because God humbled him before he exalted him. He's going to be the lead-off preacher on Shavuos. But notice how he's humbled by God before he's exalted. And also notice with great gratitude, even though he's not worthy to be reinstated among the twelve, which are now down to ten, but when he is joined back with them, there'll be eleven, and then we know that Rav Shaul becomes sort of God's replacement, the persecutor, but they also drew lots and somebody else uh, was able to stand there on Shavuos with the other 11 so that when Kepha preached for the first time there were 12 men all together standing there but the angel is saying include Petros now if this is part of the preaching of Petros you can see why it would be important to him to to keep this uh, intact and to not let this testimony be lost. And that's why I'm working so hard with the Yiddish Breed Eye to because I don't want one Yiddish word to be lost. It says, go and tell them that he, that is Moshiach ben Dovid, goes ahead before them and you go to the Galil because he'll be waiting for you there he's gonna he's gonna uh, be there as he said just as he told you and uh, then in verse 8 they went out and they run away from the tomb He's talking about the women because it was to them like they were seized with trembling and they were beside themselves and they told no one anything uh, because they had great fear and uh, on the morning that he stood up again uh, on the first day of the week he appeared to Miriam of Magdala. She was the first one to have a resurrection appearance. And she was the one that had had seven demons cast out of her by him. And uh, she went and reported this uh, appearance 
to the disciples who were weeping and mourning his death. And notice this. And when they heard what she had to say, they didn't believe her. Look at verse 11. She told them that he lives and that he had been seen by her. And they did not believe it. So those people who say, yeah, they, they uh, hid the body. They don't seem to understand that the Shulachim were initially skeptical. It took the actual resurrection appearances to make believers out of them. They did not believe that anyone could destroy death and bring immortality to light. The stupendous miracle that they witnessed with their own eyes was necessary to bring them to faith. And even doubting Thomas was like this. But notice here you see, she's telling them all, and they're too busy weeping and mourning, and they don't believe her. And uh, after that, he was manifested to another in another form. Notice this, another form. There were two disciples on the road to Emmaus walking into the field. And they saw him. And uh, it was the same risen Moshiach Ha'adon, but in another form. Not the not not exactly like with uh, Miriam by Magdala, but in a different way. But it was still, and when you read the story in Luke, when he disappears, like he disappears inside the Takrahim, and neatly folds up the head. Uh, this uh, appearing and disappearing is miraculous and he does this at the end of the uh, appearance on the road to Emmaus you could get that at the end of the Gospel of Luke and they went away and they tell others now of course now, now we're talking about the two disciples on the uh, on the wrote to Emmaus, they are doing the same thing Mary Magdalene is doing. Uh, however, also, the ones they tell don't believe. So it's not hearsay that brings people to faith. They actually have a resurrection appearance, and it's necessary to have that for them to come to faith. That should be taken note of very carefully. Then did he himself manifest, make, make uh, manifest, or reveal uh, to the to the eleven when they were by themselves, while they were sitting at Tish. And what's he doing? He's re rebuking them for their unbelief and their hardness, the obduracy of their heart, because they have not believed that he had been raised up and that he was seen by people and they still didn't believe it. They didn't believe Mary Magdalene and they didn't believe the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And when he appeared to them, he rebuked them for this unbelief and this hardness of heart. What, is, what does it mean, hardness of heart? For 28 years, my heart was so hardened that even though I had heard the gospel, I had seen depictions of the horrible crucifixion and all the things that he suffered for my sake, for my sins, but these things meant nothing to me. I was as hardened as a coroner doing an autopsy. They don't sit there and weep bitter tears. They are 
hard-hearted professional and they do their job and they don't weep like mourners but I should have been mourning for my own soul and I should have felt bad that I was judged and that he had taken my judgment and that I was I was on my way to a terrible eternal judgment because I had hardened my heart to him. I should have seen that. But for 28 years, I did not see it. Just like Rav Shaul hardened his heart until he met the Moshiach on the Damascus Road. You see, you really have to see him and know him and meet him. And it's only then that you're concerned about uh, preaching to the whole creation. It says, he who believes and allows himself toivel zain in a mikvah, that one will be saved, will possess Yeshua's Elokeinu. However, those who do not believe will be condemned. And then it says, these signs will accompany the ones who believe, the ones who go out preaching. Yo, in my name will they cast out evil, bad spirits. They will do exorcisms. They will speak with new tongues. They will be Pentecostals. With their hands, they will pick up serpents and if they drink poison. In other words, on the field, when they go into the jungles, if they reach into a, a group of uh, sticks for a campfire and a viper fas fastens his teeth on them when they pick up the snake, like Rav Shaul did on the island of Malta. The natives were amazed he did not fall down dead, even though a poisonous snake had bit him. Uh, this is also true of, of drinking something that would be uh, fatal. In other words, they're going to get protection on the field uh, in a supernatural way. God is going to help them. He's going to raise them up and uh, help them to take their machete and go through the jungle and get the job done. And, and, and uh, when they lay hands on the sick, uh, people will be healed. These are the kinds of signs that accompany, that follow the preaching. Because God is going to be working with them. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And uh, it says, he was taken up to heaven and he sat down on Hashem's right hand. Psalm 110 verse 1. Lord, I want to pray for the Yiddish Brit Hadashah. I want to pray, dear God, for every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I want to thank you that Kiva was forgiven, given another chance, preached at Shavuos, went all over the world preaching, wound up in Rome, died al Kiddush Hashem, and his preaching was written down and preserved by Mark. And I want to thank you that even though Mark himself also floundered and deserted Paul and Barnabas on the first Shalikas journey, he also was restored. Because it says in 2 Timothy, Bring Mark with you, because he is useful to the ministry. And I want to thank you, Lord, that even if as ministers we 
sometimes let you down, you do give us another chance. And I want to thank you, Lord, that when we are humbled by our failures, you're able to promote us to do even more for your glory. And you can safely exalt us because we've, we've been humbled and we're not going to get arrogant or egotistical. Father, I pray that someone will receive the Lord tonight, that they will uh, reach into the depths of their heart and say, what am I doing here? This is the one who has the words of eternal life. Why should I resist him? Why should I be hard-hearted against him? Who am I hurting but myself? I repent of all my hard-hearted obduracy and unbelief. Anytime I have scorned him or insulted his name, Father, I believe in one God, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, but I believe the Bar Enosh and the Atik Yamin, even though they are two, are one. It says that in the Zohar. And, oh God, I believe that the Ruach HaKodesh is bringing me to a saving knowledge of who he is, because without his spirit I could not declare that he is Lord. So, Father, I pray right now that you would forgive me in the name of your Son, the Zun Funderoibishter, Moshiach ben Dovid, Yeshua, come into my heart, forgive my sins, take control of my life, and I will serve you and follow you and do everything it says here at the end of the Gospel of Mark. And I'll give you all the praise. Amen.